welcome you all this evening to this, the third in our Moshev Lecture Series. As many of you know, this lecture series is one of the ways in which the college is marking the 400th anniversary of its foundation by the English Jesuits in Louvain in 1614. Quite remarkably, Heathrop is now what that college in Louvain was all those years ago, a center for the study of philosophy and theology. Then it was a college preparing men for the priesthood. Today, Heathrop does a great many things, but we still prepare men for the priesthood, and indeed, since our last Losha lecture back in November, we have marked the re-establishment of our ecclesiastical faculties of philosophy and theology, underlining, if you like, that aspect of our work. Heathrop is a member of the worldwide family of Jesuit universities and colleges. Having survived throughout the suppression of the Jesuits in the late 18th century, our college has the proud distinction of being the oldest theological college in the society all Jesuit institutions of higher education, wherever they are, and however old they may be, have this in common, our common Ignatian tradition. Informed, as we are, by our founder's belief that God can be found in all things, we can enter enthusiastically and optimistically into debates about our contemporary world and what makes for the common good in that world, a feature of our life, which I think we can see eminently displayed in the present world. We can explore the challenge of living a life of faith today, and we can ask what contribution we can make as people of faith to the preoccupations and concerns of the men and women alongside whom we live in society. These are the themes of the Loshut Lecture Series, a series in which we've been reflecting from a Christian perspective on significant social, political, and ethical issues of our day. In the first lecture, Peter Sutherland considered Britain's future in Europe, and in the second, Baroness Patricia Scotland spoke on faith, government, and social justice. For this evening's lecture, we extend a warm welcome to Lord Daniel Brennan, who will speak on the Christian's responsibility in public life for the 21st century challenges. Lord Brennan, as many of you will know, was chairman of the bar in 1999 and has been a member of the House of Lords since the year 2000. He's a member of the Matrix Chambers and specializes in commercial law, international law, and international arbitration. In 2009, he memorably represented the families of the bereaved in the Omar bombing case. Lord Brennan is also president of the Catholic Union. Now, I first met Lord Brennan here at Heathrow when he visited us 18 months ago, some of you may remember, to respond to a lecture given by Cardinal Scola on the importance of Christians getting involved in dialogue with those other faiths for the sake of the common good. In my conversations with Lord Brennan since, I have learned of his support for higher education and his belief the contribution that specifically Catholic perspective can bring to higher education. I have learned of his wide international experience and the wider perspective that experience brings to his reflections on public life and the life of the church. And I have learned of his concern that our church respond positively to the questions which modern life poses and the resources which modern life has to offer. He is therefore eminently well suited to address this theme this evening. Lord Brennan will take questions after his presentation, and he and I look forward very much to a fruitful sharing of views after his lecture. But for now, let us all welcome Lord Daniel Brennan. I'm extremely grateful to Father Michael for his generous words of welcome. I'm particularly grateful to the generous support which Heathrop receives from Bill Loshert here in the audience. But I'm standing up in a Jesuit college with trepidation. Because a university, the chaplain of our Catholic chaplaincy was a Jesuit. 
Father Benji Winterbourne, an entertaining Jesuit. He would invite each Sunday morning visiting priests to say Mass. And there was a rigid rule at the end of the sixth minute, the homily was over. And it was over because if the preacher kept on going, Benji would stand up and start singing Credo in Unum Deo. <laughs> so tonight, if there comes a time <laughs> now I'm going to talk about Christian responsibility and public life or the better title which is in the script for the talk the Christians responsibility in public life and 21st century challenges I am not going to talk about the world at large, principally about our country, and by analogy with our country, a good many European countries. Probably the only exceptions to a secular Europe we have at the moment. The only two Catholic countries left, in fact as well as in name, are Poland and Malta large and small. But what I'll say about Britain can often be said about Europe. It can't be said about Asia. China is a world apart. India, it's said, is about to elect a prime minister who is a devout <coughs> Hindu and practices his religion publicly. The Middle East is Islam. Africa is a mix of Christian and Islam, but a very different mix to Europe. Latin America, Christian, whether it be Catholic or Evangelical, and America with a strong Catholic base, 60, 70 million Catholics, whatever the figure presently is. I've made this point at the beginning because in Africa, when I go, I feel ashamed to witness the enthusiastic faith which is exhibited by our Catholic brothers and sisters in that continent, the same in Latin America. What has happened in our country to Christian <coughs> responsibility? and in public life in particular. I'm going to refer to personal responsibility, community responsibility, and national responsibility. And in doing so, I acknowledge that what I say has to be adapted to the capacity of each Catholic, each Christian's ability, or lack of it, to exercise responsibility. There's no paradigm from each according to our ability. But I think the 21st century, this one, 14 years old, is as challenging a time as Christians have had in the last three or four hundred years. And in some of the slides that I'm going to show you, behind me stands the menu for tonight, in some of the slides I'll be referring to two books, Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis, in my view should be required reading by every Catholic in the world and if they can't understand it, the priest or the laity should explain it to them. It's the most powerful expression of simple, basic Christian sentiment we've had probably in modern times. And the second book 
not so common in this country because we don't teach Catholic social teaching the way we did in my school when I was young. The compendium of the social doctrine of the church issued in 2004, it's 10 years old, by the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. And within it, you'll find, by reference to gospel and cyclical, other papal documents and church documents from Vatican Council too, the basis for the social doctrine of the church, what it means in daily life. So with those two books to which I'll make reference under the title EG or Compendium, we have a lot of assistance in meeting these challenges. But what is the first challenge? Our society. If we go back three, four hundred years, the Age of Enlightenment starting at the end of the 17th century into the early 19th was an intellectual revelation in Europe. And everybody came to terms with it as time went by. But by the early 19th century, when science and technology in its early days was established, the Royal Society, etc., there was a cultural tangent which is called the Age of Romanticism. It wasn't just poetry, it was pictures, music, almost the Victorian culture after the Georgian. And that, interestingly, went on at the same time as the Industrial Revolution and the creation, expansion of empire. The British, Spanish, the American in practical purposes, Philippines, Cuba, and so on. It was a very different century to what had gone before. And in modern terms, modern terms, relatively peaceful if you start at Waterloo. Plenty of wars, but nothing like what happened in the 20th century. I think history will declare it to be a century of war. The two world wars were the most terrible events humankind has ever suffered. The repetition of them with the centenary of the 1914 war is required. We should remember them always. It was the century of isms, two in particular, totalitarianism and communism, each of which played a part in the wars. Hitler by in the Second War, Stalin by switching sides, and it was the end of empire. The United Nations marked the beginning of the end of col colonies worldwide. It was a century of major social development, especially in the second, uh, especially in the period after the Second World War. People had fought two wars. They wanted health, education, transport, simple things of life to be given to them. And science and technology in one century achieved more than had previously been achieved in the history of mankind. Some century. What about this one? Well, the social development I make mention of there is interesting because for people of my age, the period from 45 to probably the 60s was the period of post-war stability, making the country work again. And then it started to work. And with science and technology, it meant that from the 60s and 70s, what became the most important thing in life? 
Once you had a hospital, a school, transport system, it was what can I buy with my money? Materialism, rampant, and it still is all-consuming, as you might say, in this century. And I put it brutally, the 21st century so far in Europe of the West, Britain in particular, is the cult of the individual. At the top is a quotation from Pope Francis, if you just read it. Would you disagree? And the basic message of it is superficiality. There's no depth in day-to-day -day life anymore. It's all things and events and enjoyment. So we have, in parliamentary debates I've had it, people actually quote this phrase, the absolute rights of the individual. Well, the rights of the individual, yes, but the absolute rights? It's almost an absurdity for people to express it. It's accompanied by religion as private and personal. This age is materialistic and self-obsessed. I put it in quotes, Jeremy Paxman. Hardly a Christian apologist. And he said it about this country just a week or two back very strongly and in public. So we have what I call the ethics of convenience. Not what's right, what suits. And public morality is not determined by a generally accepted norm. It's determined by what the majority want. Melanie Phillips, the lady who writes in the Daily Mail, 95% of the time I disagree with her, but she used this phrase I think is quite telling in an article a week or two back, we're in the post-moral society. Now I'm talking tough, I'm provoking, why not? Of course there are good things in the world, but what is the prevailing sentiment? That's what counts in our society, and the prevailing sentiment is we want to do what we want. In 1515, it's thought, Hieronymus Bosch finished this marvelous triptych, The Garden of Earthly Delights. If you close the triptych, the two outer panels form the world, the globe, pictures as it was in Genesis. You open it up, that was God's plan, and what do we have 500 years ago? On the left of the triptych, God creating Adam and then Eve and founding human life in the world is created. And then in the middle, us. If you look at the picture carefully in the Prado in Madrid, it's absolutely astonishing to see the variety of human perversion that they could think about in 1515. And it was all designed to show in that middle panel that for people, if you let it happen, life is what I can get in whichever way accommodates my desires. Earthly delights. And on the right of the triptych is damnation. You pay hellfire. That's a basic use of the picture as an allegory. There are many others that can be adopted. So here's tonight's imagery challenge for you. Just think in your mind's eye, what would a modern triptych of the 21st century in 2015, 500 years after Bosch, have as its content. 
the left hand side wouldn't have anything to do with God it would have to do with men and women and children it wouldn't have anything to do with marriage particularly there might be a, a little footnote at the bottom explaining that we spend 8.4 billion a year on single parent families and 500 million a year on the child support agency and you wonder what is going on what's happened to start things off on the left hand triptych and we go into the centre one I'm going to leave it blank no part of my task tonight to expostulate on modern perversion <laughs> you could fill it up very quickly and very easily and it'll all be me and the triptych on the right won't be damnation in the afterlife it'll be damnation in this life for the next generation harbourless in terms of an ethic morally homeless how do we recover? Now, I repeat, I'm talking tough. It's a serious challenge to the optimists in Europe to produce a triptych for me which gives a positive picture. Of course you can improve it, but a positive picture in the moral and societal sense, I doubt it. Well, that's a bit of pictorial entertainment, but there's a point to it, which is a very profound one. The profound point is this. We are in the era of I. We don't talk about we anymore, except when we talk about entitlement. We are entitled to, so that I can have I've chosen the word era because it's precise. An era is an age, a period, an epoch, call it what you will, marked by a particular characteristic. And the characteristic at the moment is the cult of the individual, I. And the big task, the big challenge, is to make sure that the era doesn't become a neon where you lose sight of length of time an era has usually got a limited lifespan to it I don't think I've heavily exaggerated the position in moral terms I'm almost driven to rely on Bertrand Russell convinced atheist who said you cannot have a society without a moral framework a moral framework not a set of convenient topics that we might pay obeisance to over a short time Pope Francis in his apostolic exhortation says in our time humanity is at a changing point a turning point of its history and I think he's right what are we going to do with our modern world do with it as against exist within it now that's a big challenge I said to my son the other day, who was expecting his second child, is the first word going to be mama or papa? And he said the first word is probably going to be Google. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's the biggest challenge of all. How to cope with this world. Let's move on to communication. Forgive me 
for dealing with things simplistically. We think, we speak, we make gestures, and there's understanding. It's so simple, or at least it was so simple, not anymore. Before we relied on person to person, group to group, images of whatever kind, print, the latter part of the 20th century television radio, but it was an essentially personal contact <laughs> through which communication, it means sharing, was achieved. Now what about today? We add to the beginning two items, media and the internet, sorry, media, which I call the vertical, an internet and social network which I call the horizontal. Media is the mass media, television, radio, press, and it's vertical because it's mass. It's straight at you as a nation or a community. Internet and social network is horizontal. It passes between each of us, singularly, one to one, or in a communal way through social network. It's a completely different form of machine-led communication to what human beings have previously experienced. Now this is a real challenge in this century. Let's just think about the power of the internet and social network. The Pope, 12 million contributors to his Twitter page. Also, by the way, lots of anti-Pope Twitters. It wasn't all one way, but 12 million within a year or a few months whenever it started. The Ukraine, when they were still trying to get rid of Yanukovych, there was a young student on YouTube asking for outside help. It had four million hits in the first 12 hours. Four million. It helped that she was charming, beautiful, of course, but still that's an enormous illustration of direct power of communication. Now, how are we going to cope with that? The homily on Sunday is for those listening. The church's witness to the world outside is a much bigger arena. How are we going to deal with it? What about the style and quality of modern communication in this world? What's happened to the person-to-person -person gestures of which the Pope is a master? He's a master of sign and gesture. It's a fundamental aspect of human interconnection. Are we going to replace it with cut and paste of what we see on the machine? How do we preserve clarity? I mean clarity of thought so that we can have clarity of expression so that we can have understanding with each other so we can convince people about Christian responsibility. I think this is a really difficult task. There's actually a word the Americans have invented which I think is fabulously evocative of this clarity or the lack of it on the internet. It's called baffle gab. <laughs> to be baffled by the gab. <laughs> Marvelous word, baffle gab but it's millions of words nobody can really understand. The power of the brief, the short sound bite, image bite, I think the Pope is a genius at this. The, the phrase about priests and the smell of the sheep, fantastically evocative. I mean, that's a speech in one line. The other day with a mafia, 
you will end in hell. That's an incredibly powerful statement in its imagery, getting back to Bosch. Now, of course, we can't reduce dialogue to one-liners, but we can certainly think about starting a dialogue with a one-liner or finishing it with a one-liner. Something powerful and succinct. I remember talking to some people in Scotland about euthanasia, some Catholics, and they said to me, what do you call the anti-euthanasia outfit in England? I said, it's called care, not killing. And this, one of the Scotsmen said to me, that's utterly ridiculous. What kind of a title is that? It doesn't mean anything to anybody. I said, what do you call it up north? He said, we call it, don't kill your granny. <laughs> <laughs> Makes the point, doesn't it? And above all, I think we need a sense of humor in life, especially in dialogue, exhibiting our Christian thinking. It's very important. Pope Francis has it. Most human beings have it. My father told me, always be suspicious of people who don't have a sense of humor. And he's right, or was right. Typical example, in public life, which I like to use because it's so entertaining, Ronald Reagan became president when he was 70. You remember him saying about his opponent, he's only 55 and you're 70, what are you going to say about this? He said, you're right, I don't have his level of inexperience. <laughs> and then at a press conference after he'd been president for a year or so, it became known that he'd have a long nap in the afternoon, not half an hour, two or three hours. So a guy gets up at the press conference and says to him, Mr. President, what are you going to say to the people who say about you that you're asleep on the job a lot of the time? He said, they're right. I am. And you know why? Because my doctor said to me when I came into this job, he said, Mr. President, you have to be careful because hard work could kill you. So I thought to myself, why take the risk? <laughs> End of press conference. Now, what am I saying? A Christian, the front of this book, a Christian should have a smiling face. We're not here to bore the pants off people. We're here to make them. The word that comes up all the time in this book, make them realize the joy of being a Christian, which isn't just exaltation from time to time, but daily happiness at the gift we have. Now, why have I spent time on this? You're probably mostly well-educated people. It's just a waste of time preparing something to convince somebody else based on your level and your way of thinking. It isn't going to work. This isn't an internal 19th century debating shop anymore. It's a world out there where communication is power. And we've got to wake up to this reality in this century. We have to be effective in our communication. So, all of those things which I've saved up till now, you've got to wake up to this. When you arrange your expressions, it's a tough job communicating. Churchill, it takes me hours to prepare all my best short speeches. It's true. The message deserves preparation. Next, setting the agenda. This is a really serious, difficult issue. Who sets the agenda in the United Kingdom each day these days? Paul Dacre through the Daily Mail, the Murdochs 
through the time, times, the sun, TV, especially the short bullet point TV type of newscast. The vertical meter is very powerful, very powerful. And they set the agenda. In 1922, the famous journalist Walter Lippmann was the first person to start writing about public opinion and the media, the interrelation between them. It took till the 68 presidential election in the States for people to realize the powerful correlation between, in that campaign, what people thought the issues were and what the media said the issues were. A very powerful correlation. So the media are fed by politics, interest groups, policy makers, the commentariat, and they push it down to public opinion. Except in the last 10 years or 15, the horizontal media is coming in at the side. Probably a Twitter expose or a blog which is brilliantly written can create more upheaval overnight than something in the vertical media. It just sweeps the internet electrically. Now that's a very, very different world to what the vertical media are used to. It can work for and against good communication in terms of setting the agenda. But what am I saying? I'm saying the obvious. In this country, it's extremely difficult for us to set the agenda. We can try to influence it. We can try to build on an agenda that has been set at the bottom. The public can respond through the horizontal media, through its contact with the media, and also with letters to MPs. I can tell you, they listen, electorally speaking, to what they read from their constituents. They'd be dumb if they didn't. And if you get enough people writing about enough on a topic, they will respond. Never hesitate to write to an MP. Volume counts. No doubt about it. You're a voter. That's the click. So where do we go next? How do we influence? Well, this is not easy. Obtrusive things, taxation, the price of houses, everybody knows about it. It doesn't need the Daily Mail or the Sun to tell us. We know what the issues are. The unobtrusive issues, different question. The ones that aren't in front of us all the time. Same-sex marriage. Forget the rights and wrongs of it. Just look at it historically. Both Labour and Conservative governments in their manifestos and the elections of 2005 and 10, neither made any statement about same-sex marriage as a manifesto commitment. Nothing. Indeed, the government had said at the time of the Civil Partnerships Bill, that's enough. No more is required. So between 2010 and last year, within three years, we're meant to believe that there was a tidal wave of opinion which had always been there in modern times and nobody had properly understood it. I don't buy that. <coughs> the media, in particular television and radio, set the agenda on that issue. And I think we've got a seriously difficult task in meeting this third challenge. Now, most important, what do we do now in the 21st century? 
A couple of examples. The common good. Why don't we tell people, before we start saying, I want you to convince you about X or Y, why don't we tell them what we believe in, what is worth listening to? We have the irony now, the irony that the Church of England has adopted our social teaching as their social teaching. It sells. Morris Glassman, the Jewish chap, who went to see the Pope the other day and was well thought of by Pope Francis. He's for the common good. We have something to sell. A quote from Lumen Gentium. He, God, has called them together as a people and not as isolated individuals. John Donne. No man is an island entire of itself. We are a community. T.S. Eliot, there is no life without community and there is no community without God. The second, religious freedom. This is very important. We fought a world war and part of the reason was to make sure that people were free to think exercise their conscience and their religion in an open society. And that was vindicated by John the Twenty-third and Parchment Terrace. We have to push this hard. Push it hard. Baroness Hale, Supreme Court judge, a week or two ago in Yale, said, why don't the Christian churches in the UK Instead of arguing the secular agenda of discrimination, argue the common agenda of human rights. This one, the cross at work, freedom to manifest your religion. And then current issues, modern slavery. This is truly international. And the church, as you can see by my reference, De Evangelia Gaudium is aware of it. There's a draft bill before Parliament and the Church in Rome are seeking to have an international line of action on this. That's a story we should be part of. And lastly, euthanasia. We need to get tough on this. It's not some intellectual salon debate where people of the right kind of educational background can decide for us and our relatives when the time has come to switch off the machine or press the injection into the aged person or the terminally ill patient. This is a matter for the entire society. Three points to you, which I think make a powerful argument against. What does it do to the medical profession, doctors and nurses? Are there going to be two Hippocratic oaths? The one that says, I will not kill the patient, and the other one that says, I will assist the death of a patient if so requested. That's two completely different attitudes to medical practice. And we should be fighting that argument as our argument, not just the doctor's argument. It puts the conscience arguments from the Abortion Act into a secondary category, this one. Which doctor are you? Death or life? <coughs> are we entitled as a society to tell doctors you must assist in a death because Parliament has decided there's a group of a thousand people or so who are entitled to it. Not a very good response. The next argument, eugenics. History repeats itself. In the 20s, the Fabian Society, of which I'm a member, had the Webbs 
Sydney and Beatrice as their founding supporters. Both of them were pro-eugenic. As Oliver Wendell Holmes said in a public speech, Supreme Court judge in the States at the end of the last century, three generations of an imbecile is enough. It was very intellectually fashionable. It went into the 30s. Hitler practiced it. The strongest speech in a recent debate against this new assisted dying suggestion was from a lady in the House of Lords who's in a wheelchair desperately disabled, she can hardly breathe, Baroness Campbell. And she was making the point with as much energy as she could muster. Once you pass this kind of law, people like me will be regarded as expendable. You will make an immediate distinction in terms of your valuation of life between A and B. And when you start on that gradient, how valuable things are, you finish up with a type of eugenics. And the third and most important of all, economics. Demographically, in 30 years' time, the majority of our society, in economic terms and what they cost, are going to be the old. Certainly true in Russia, Spain in particular, surprisingly. So what happens then if we pass an assisted dying law and doctors are regularly giving injections? What happens economically? The old do become expendable. They become too expensive. 75 is enough. Sign off. Death clinics will be around the corner. Orwell, brilliant writer, he said, it's amazing how the intellectual mind can invent any kind of belief. And this will be the intellectual mind. Of course, it's reasonable. You've had a good life. The others that follow can't afford you. Let's be reasonable. The message, I would stick to those for the next few years. And the most important of all, to finish off, making it work. Christy Fidel is like he, Pope John Paul says, it's our job in society, not the clergy. Primarily, in daily public life, it's us who speaks to the person we're talking to in our community, in our job, who can influence things. And then in organizational terms, the Catholic Union, Catholic Voices, which has been a tremendous success, Caritas Social Network, and the concept of a responsible citizen. And how do we argue it? Identity. This is very important at the beginning of the century. What is a Christian in this century? What do we stand for is the second point, and why, witness, and third advocacy, speaking out. And then Benedict, marvelous user of words intellectually. Let's do it in a friendly way, by attraction, he says. Or as Pat Boone sang it in the 50s, by friendly persuasion, great song. And then at the bottom, just read those words. This is from the Upper Athena, the great bishops conference in Latin America in 2007. It's a get up and go message, not a give in message for us in the church and for Christians generally. The The last point I want to make about this is things we can actually do making it work. Why don't we join with Morris Glasman, Catholic 
laity can do it through its organisations in the plan to create <coughs> a common good foundation interreligious across society. Not some nebulous stuff like the big society, something concrete. When it comes to the internet, why don't we raise half a million pounds? That's 500,000 Catholics giving a pound a year in a population of five million to run a laity website on issues such as the ones I've just taken you through. There are plenty of young researchers in my law office who can produce the answer to everything in five minutes and produce you a, a website entry within ten. The assets are there. The cost is low. We need some imagination. And what about the fact that we're doing this as Christians? Several eight years ago, I organized in the House of Lords a meeting of all Christian lay groups in the Catholic Church to meet together. They'd never actually met socially in the memory of any of them. And the point was, we're all working together for a common objective. And finally, why don't we once a year, through whatever the Catholic laity can do, produce a scorecard? I don't mean a scorecard. Results-based analysis. What do we plan to do? What happened? What did we achieve? And what's the result? You've been extremely patient. And I've been taking too much of your time about things which you might think are technical. They're not. What I've taken you through are the ways in which in this century we make the message understood. If we don't meet these challenges, we won't meet what the priests in South America wanted, an action-based, evangelical, gospel-driven Christianity. And let's do it with gusto. With gusto. The last slide. The words at the top. Well, I agree. You agree. Let's go to it. Thank you. Brennan will know me. Um, my concern, and I've been pushing to do something about this, is actually we're still too much afraid to come out in public and say we are the Catholics, we are the Christians. I mean, I, following the appeal two years ago by our Archbishop, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, wear my cross in public. Very few people will show that they are Christians by this. I'm continually being said, what are you doing that for? Um, particular for uh, the point I, I, sorry, I'm going on a bit. The, the, the thing I've been trying to push is, is we, we do not as collect, collectively show our role. And I happen to be a local councillor, and one of the things I'm trying to do is make sure that we, our Catholic councillors make themselves known, because they don't. And we are an, a, a, a political influence. Sorry, it's not a question, Laura, but it, it, it's a comment. I, I don't think we're doing enough, basically, and I agree with you. I'm Mary Clarkson. I'm um, a member of Catholic Voices and I'm a Labour councillor in, in, in Oxford. Um, I think one of, one of my comments is, and I, I agree very much with, with Lord Brennan's uh, analysis of, of the issues in society, um, but I think for people to listen to us, we need to acknowledge that some people, even without a sort of moral framework, have nevertheless got a good intent in what they do. So when they're talking about euthanasia, a lot of it is about the relief of suffering, and we have to say to them, yes, that is right. We, too, believe that we have to relieve suffering and, and, and look, at, look at things like the hospice movement rather than just saying, you know, we, we, we get rid of people when they're, when they're 75. So I think we have to acknowledge that a lot of people have a good intent rather than being confrontational. 
the danger is that we come across as rather unsympathetic if we don't acknowledge their good intent. So to you, my name's Michael Trimmer. I'm a, I'm a journalist here with uh, Christian today. Uh, I just asked the question about the, talking about the beginning of your the discussion. You're talking about the state of the society. How do we avoid the suggestion that this is a sort of there's a sort of very traditional refrain of all religious communities that society is in trouble and we must work to uh, to sort of to fix it to make it better. How do we avoid the, the sort of the suggestion that we're a broken record in that regard? That every generation's religious community has always um, has always sort of had this message. And I think I'd also ask. What is it? Is there something particular about? Would you say about the current generation that is different? I mean, I think you you sort of touched on that, but I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little on that point. So the lady back there, I came to be confrontational to wake you all up, <laughs> but obviously in public life you have to do it. What was the phrase I used? By attraction. But that doesn't mean to say that you can't be firm. You can be polite but firm. But clearly it's got to be by attraction. You're never going to get anywhere in modern life by telling people what they should think. You can't impose beliefs. As I said, it's got to be friendly persuasion. That's very important. We don't go out into public life to beat our chests in some self-fulfilling act of Christian duty where nobody listens to us. That's a waste of time. Ian Potts has got a very important point. I imagine that if a couple of researchers got together, they could produce a sheet of A4 about the church in this country, which would show in the amount of schools, hospices, good work centers, food banks, whatever it is, how much work the Catholic Church does for this country every day of the year. That's the way you'd start. Who am I? I'm part of this group that does this. If you agree with it, can we talk about ways that you might be able to help in your way of life? I can't believe how little the public in this country, the non-Christian public, know about what we actually do. And that can be very easily remedied. The third point about the broken record is a very telling point. I didn't speak to you tonight as a TV or radio producer or as a national newspaper editor, although I expressed some of their ways of thinking to you. But the fact is, that a lot of young people these days, one, haven't the faintest idea about Christianity. They just don't know what it means. And the broken record is likely to be the response of those who are already so prejudiced, there's no point in talking to them anyway. Of course, you never give up, but they'll not be very, very fruitful. So I think in this century, We've got to stop thinking our age. The movers and shakers of the next 10, 15 years in terms of society are going to be the young because they will respond to public opinion polls, especially on the internet or newspapers or TV, press the red button. It's usually not going to be well informed it's the way I feel today, yes or no. But it's going to have very powerful effects. It's a kind of vicarious democracy that we might face in 20 years' time, where instead of the voice on Saturday night, it's euthanasia, is it this, is it that, press the right button, and the government will do it on Monday morning. Do I exaggerate? Read all well again. Sometimes, I don't just mean this about science and technology, sometimes learning can become a quasi-religion. Some parts of science and technology and 
medicine can become a way of living to the proponents of it. And that can produce, ultimately, a risk to human society as we know it. Now, this is a serious risk, right? If we have a society that's based on TV and consumerism and the internet, and the control of societies in the hands of a middle-class intellectual elite, and the educational standards aren't progressing very well, society will revert to previous norms. The few will control the many, and will do it by giving the many what the few think the many want. I'm exaggerating, but there's a point here. Society, I think, has peaks and troughs. It often repeats itself, either on the down or on the up. So, broken record. I don't use records anymore. I only use the internet. <laughs> My iTunes is... I'll think of some hymn before I've finished. <laughs> But I have to, the point that some of you made tonight, why are we so po-faced about our religion? We're so lacking in enthusiastic energy in explaining ourselves in a nice way. Why not? The opponent will readily tell you how top naive your intellectual level is a practicing Christian, often in a not so nice way. I've heard some speeches in the Lords about this that would have done badly in a six-form debate. They were so laced with prejudice. No. End of message. We've got to think the message through again in whichever way we want to make it. Day by day, year by year, it changes. The whole thing about what I've been taking through tonight, and this Pope understands it, things change. But within change, the basics should prevail. Hello. Um, in um, Pope Francis's uh, Evangelic Gradium, he makes a big emphasis on the role of the Holy Spirit, and that's where the joy comes from. And if everybody was converted, then um, and they were living in society, they would change society in that way. Um, the Alpha Movement is very effective at uh, uh, educating people and also introducing them to the Holy Spirit. Do you not think this is the way to go? Uh, Lord Brennan, Robert Rigby, um, a local councillor in Westminster and also chairman of the Catholic Union. Um, you've spoken a lot about the laity, but may I ask specifically about the Catholic Church and our clergy and the bishops in this country? Do you think, I mean, we've talked about communication. Is there more that perhaps um, they could be doing? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Rob Flello, Member of Parliament for Stoke on Trent South. Um, a couple of quick points, if I may. I think, first of all, in terms of um, secularization, I, I, I recall Wilberforce, I think, in a practical view uh, of Christianity a couple of hundred years ago, talked about, and I paraphrase, that um, for most people, their view of Christianity was half-remembered Sunday school lessons and what they thought Christianity was about. Um, I think the difference now is that they probably haven't got the half-remembered Sunday school lessons. And I think that's the, the, a huge concern for me. Um, I think in terms of branding, I, I, if I understood part of your, your um, comments correctly, I think one of the things that perhaps we should be much better at is branding what we do. So when all the organisations do things, have a, a common brand of, uh, you know, I'm doing this, I'm running this food bank, I'm involved with Catholic Union, whatever, I'm doing it because actually I'm doing it uh, as, a, as a Christian, however you, you brand that, but have a common brand. And finally, if I may, I think the other thing that I think is so important is actually Catholics need to also, as well as being more prominent in, in terms of their Catholicism, I think we also need to stand and support each other a little bit more. I know certainly from personal experience, when I was voting against the same-sex marriage bill, I could have really done with a lot more support from fellow Catholics. Um, <clears throat> my name's Paul Gismondi. Um, I agree that we need to be doing something, and I think we absolutely much more radical. And the reason why Pope Francis has appealed to everybody, uh, whether Catholic or not around the world, is because he's absolutely radical for the moment he stepped out on the balcony. And it wasn't radical about what he was saying or banging on about, but the way he is. And I think that's what we need to recover. 
to me, it's not about uh, trying to rebrand the church, remarket the Catholic Church, uh, and so on. It's a, it's a radical change in spirituality that has um, been waiting ever since we had Vatican II, and we still haven't even started. Um, and um, so I think in terms of what the agenda that you talk about, we need to understand also who's been setting the agenda and how that's been engineered. And it's been engineered very specifically for decades, in a very particular way, with a very particular end. And we haven't even been talking, I mean, not here, but in general, nobody's talking about that. It's a very, very strong uh, movement that has been doing this very specifically. It's coming out all around the world in all the political events we're seeing. And I don't hear anyone talking about it within the church. When I speak about it, I'm usually a lone voice. Um, so going back to what the last um, um, gentleman was saying there, I absolutely agree. I think in the, in, in the Catholic Church, I have experienced hardly any solidarity when I stand up for things. And I'm not talking about standing up for euthanasia or you know, uh, the, the, the usual things, but about fundamental principle of um, the way we view the human being today, which is actually what is under attack. I'm a man of grey hair, and my family know that when the time comes, the opening hymn at my funeral will be Veni Creato Spiritus. It's the most beautiful expression of the importance of the Holy Spirit of Christian spirituality that I can think of, but you're right. But the Holy Spirit is uh, the way in which we should act. And I think the more we act, the more it's the Holy Spirit acting. In other words, pray, yes, Holy Spirit, yes, but action as well. My view about the English Catholic Church and the hierarchy and clergy is a very friendly one. <laughs> They're decent people doing their best, just like us. But you have to realize that we are a minority in this country. Five million or so Catholics out of 60. It's a small minority. We can be strong, but we have to be prudent. And I think that it's certainly only in my lifetime, probably since Basil Hume, that Catholics in this country have taken a, a deserved and proper place in the public life of the nation, generally speaking. There always were people at the senior level, but generally speaking. And I think we have to work later in church together. I've used this phrase many times. We have to be as a Catholic Church in this country, a creative minority. In other words, not a threat, but a benefit. It's one of the peculiar advantages of being an influential minority, if you use it properly. Education, branding, what we believe in, Somebody with some in, uh, literary, educational, journalistic skill should extract from this book two or three pages of the most important statements by the Pope with a couple of bullet points under each one explaining how that affects ordinary life. It's an easy task which could be circulated in every church in the country after mass and circulated in every school in the country. You have to be pretty dumb if you're beyond eight, nine, ten years of age not to understand Pope Francis's words. He's definitely not a polysyllabic writer. So I think that is an easy way to start and to make sure people are given it as they go through school at different stages with different bullet points according to their age and understanding. I cannot 
conceive how in the next 20, 30 years we're going to influence public life or our own lives without not just understanding the social teaching of the church, but advocating it, practicing it. I mean, this stops politicians talking in their tracks. It so plainly illustrates what the common good requires. We've got the treasure, why don't we spend it in the right ways? I don't actually agree that Pope Francis is radical. In a religious sense, I don't. And I actually think that we in Europe think he's radical, in inverted commas, in the way he speaks and his signs and gestures, because we're so spiritually fatigued. The rest of the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, they speak like this. This is their language. They're gospel driven. You go to church and you could weep in Africa at the energy of the faith around you. He knows that. You don't get articles around those countries saying what's happening to the Pope. They know he's their Pope. He's one of us. Now, I appreciate what you're saying. We have to be much more determined publicly. Your point about solidarity is exceptionally important. Uh, on public issues, we should stand together and be seen to be standing together. But I actually think that Pope Francis, far from being radical, is simply an exponent of essential Christianity. Cool, whichever phrase you want to use. And that's why it's so refreshing. I must say, I'm not suggesting that uh, we go out and hug each other in the streets, but his gestures of affection and love towards people when he goes, I was in Rome about six months ago. I've been many, many times to Rome. John Paul, John the 23rd, I can never remember the sense almost of electricity in St. Peter's Square this poem generates compared to previous ones. It's absolutely astonishing. And it doesn't come from long speeches or whatever. It basically comes from short words and very powerful gestures. I mean, kissing that man with elephant tarsus who looked the way he did, what a gesture. Letting somebody put that little lamb around his shoulders. I mean, this man understands people. And let's hope that the Roman system doesn't stop him doing what he's doing. Is that it? Be before, before, before Father Michael, can I just, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a drink apparently. But back to the sense of humor. Hilaire Belloc's Grace, I recommend to you all. Where'er the Catholic sun doth shine, there you will find laughter and good red wine. <laughs> At least I have always found it so. Benedicamus Domino. 